Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started this afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to talk, continue uh, talking about our livestock management CDE. Uh, today, we're going to talk about sheep, predominantly focusing on health management and quality assurance. Uh, Dr. Brink couldn't be with us uh, this afternoon, but uh, he put a lot of this material together. He and I worked on uh, developing this particular uh, webinar and uh, associated station with it. In general, uh, as we talk about what your students are going to be expected to do, uh, one, we're going to ask the students to have a basic understanding of some common sheep diseases. We've got a, uh, an online reference available where most of that will come. It's complete with pictures and everything. We've identified 10 sheep diseases that they need to be familiar with. In addition, we think it's important for them to understand a little bit about some of the internal parasites uh, that may affect sheep. And likewise, we've identified five of those, uh, and we have an online reference that is very good in terms of that respect. Uh, things to look at, you know, be able to identify them, talk about the damage that they might cause, uh, possibly uh, how we might diagnose it, treat it, etc. The other thing that we're going to focus on is basically basic quality assurance principles, uh, things related to simply label information, instructions, uh, calculation of dosage rates, uh, being able to demonstrate proper administration uh, technique for both uh, IM sub-Q injections, where they should be administered, uh, selection of the proper length and gauge of needle, uh, be able to uh, recognize what a withdrawal period is and determine a uh, potential first marketing date after administration of a pharmaceutical and then the importance of maintaining records. So in general, that is what we're expecting uh, the students to kind of have an understanding of. So I'm gonna go through these in a little more detail. Uh, we've identified 10 common diseases. I'll probably put this as a supplemental uh, uh, document for you so that you can actually see the 10 diseases. Uh, but I've got five of them listed here, caseous lymphadenitis, clostridial diseases, specifically it's enterotoxemia type D. It's commonly known as overeating disease. Uh, it's common with market lambs when we feed them really to grow really fast. It affects the really fast growing uh, lambs. Uh, epididymitis, uh, that is a disease uh, that cause, uh, has an issue with rams. Uh, of course, mastitis with lactating ewes. Uh, pink eye. Another one that we've got, uh, pregnancy toxemia is associated with uh, ewes that maybe are giving uh, birth to multiple, uh, are giving multiple births, twins and triplets. Scrapey, sore mouth, urinal, urinary calculi, also known as water belly, and uh, white muscle disease, which is kind of a degenerative uh, disease of the muscle. So with those are the 10 diseases we're going to focus on. You don't have to focus on any more. I've got a reference here, and I'm gonna bring that over to you, give you a, a quick uh, look at what that kind of looks like. But uh, this reference, if you bring it up here, it's called uh, Sheep 101, Sheep 201. It's a beginner's guide to raising sheep. There's a really, it's a good website for sheep production. It's got a tremendous amount of information. We're gonna focus on the health side of things in terms of using it related to both diseases and parasites. So. What you've got is you can scan down. Now, there's far more information here in terms of diseases than what we're gonna talk about. So you only need to focus on the 10 that we identified. But it is complete with pictures along the left side, giving them examples of what stuff looks like. And if your students are into gross looking stuff, this is the place to be, okay? Um, and then over on the, on the right side is basically the description of that particular disease. For example, under clostridial diseases, here is that enterotoxemia type D, classic known as overeating disease. Uh, basically, the, provides a description, says it's the most common sheep disease in the world, exactly what type of bacterium causes it, um, says it here commonly strikes the largest, fastest growing lambs in the flock, uh, things like that. So some basic good information for, for them. Now, I'm gonna slide that out of the way and kind of go through an example of what we might expect. What we're projecting to have students do as a part of this station is one, is we may actually put some, use, take some pictures. And from the pictures, ask them to identify those diseases. Now, 
They're going to be limited, just those 10 that we gave you. But for example, we might give them this picture right here. Anybody know what I've what the picture might be? Pink eye. That is pink eye. It is pink eye. Okay. So we may ask them to identify what that picture is. Another thing that we might do is we may actually bring out a live animal. It'll be a healthy animal, but we'll bring out a live animal. And we may say for this given disease, whatever it might be, describe where you might see the symptoms being manifested in this animal or describe and show how you would, where you would look to identify issues with this animal. And then of course we are, we'll probably incorporate a few general questions. All the questions would come from the information that we're providing you uh, on those 10 basic questions. So for example, uh, can you vaccinate for this disease? Okay. Uh, and this happens to be pink eye. Can you vaccinate it? If you go back into that reference, it'll basically say there is no, no uh, vaccinations that are really work for this disease. So no, you cannot vaccinate. So that's what we would do is we would say they would have to identify it as pink eye. Uh, the scientific term is infectious keratoconjunctivitis. Um, it's a highly contagious disease that affects the eyes. Uh, and then the question, can you vaccinate it? No, there's no effective vaccine. So that might be an example question related to the disease that we may incorporate. So that's what we're envisioning in terms of the diseases, focusing on those 10 that we provided. Now, some other things, uh, well, I guess I already mentioned this. On the live animal, maybe have them show where the symptoms manifest, show us how to diagnose. Um, I pulled off uh, three pictures here. Uh, two of the three we've got identified as one of your 10. But for example, this happens to be sore mouth, okay? Uh, they got some pictures that are a little more gruesome than this, but basically around the mouth, you get a lot of sores that start to develop. They could show us exactly where they would look and what they're looking for. Uh, the second picture in here basically is mastitis. If you have a lactating you, where are they looking for? They could feel up underneath, the, show us that they need to feel up underneath the udder. They're feeling for hardness in the udder. They're feeling for warmth. Uh, in the udder, warmer than than normal, because there's going to be an infection in there that's basically causing an elevated temperature. Uh, this last one we don't have listed, but that's actually a goiter, uh, basically that is in the neck region. So those would be examples of diseases where, okay, we got the live animal, we think it's got this disease, you tell us where it's located. Um, and then how to describe what would be the effect on the animal. Uh, perhaps here it's animal's not going to eat like he normally would. This is going to have, mastitis is going to have an issue in terms of being able to lactate appropriately and may actually not uh, be willing to uh, let the lambs nurse, those types of things. So that's kind of what we're projecting uh, as the focus on the disease component. Identification, what's it affect? How do we kind of see what we're, what we're doing there? Now, in terms of the internal parasites, we're gonna limit us to five basic internal parasites, uh, gastrointestinal worms, basically known as roundworms, nematodes, or stomach worms, all different terms for basically the same thing. Tapeworms, lungworms, liver flukes, and uh, coccidia or coccidiosis. And uh, I'll pull this back over again, that reference, for internal parasites is we have same type of thing. We have pictures along the left here that kind of illustrate some of these pictures, illustrate some of the effects that we might see in terms of the animals. And over here on the right, for example, here's gastrointestinal worms, roundworms, nematodes, stomach worms, information regarding uh, how that becomes manifested in the animal, what it does, what tissues it attacks, and that type of thing. So uh, same thing for lung, lung worms, liver flukes, et cetera. Okay. Um, just kind of give you some general pictures and we'll have this, we've got this here. These are some additional pictures of the actual uh, 
parasites themselves. This is a picture of nematodes or roundworms. Uh, basically, it's round and slender, uh, extremely long. Uh, here's a picture of a tapeworm. Again, extremely long. It's kind of somewhat segmented. They might kind of identify a tapeworm. Uh, these are lungworms that kind of penetrate uh, that area. And liver flukes, kind of a unique little thing. This is a common uh, 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 parasite, particularly as you go a little bit farther south. And then uh, he's got some pictures of coccidia, uh, which manifests itself as coccidiosis. So those would be some pictures where we might ask them to, what is this particular parasite? So we're expecting, maybe from some of those pictures, be able to identify a parasite, uh, describe the primary site of manifestation, where in the body uh, is that particular uh, parasite having an effect, and then what might be the potential impact of related tissue damage. So for example, what we might do is we may give them something like this, okay? So they've got that picture, we may ask them, what is the parasite? What's the primary site of attack? And what's the potential impact of the tissue damage? Uh, that actually happens to be a roundworm or a nematode. Uh, it primarily, in sheep, uh, it pierces the lining of the abomasum, which happens to be the true stomach of the sheep, and hence the term stomach worms, okay? Um, the potential impact of its damage, which is listed in that, uh, online reference that we provided is basically it's anemia. Uh, uh, basically they're not getting enough iron and so forth, but it's characterized with pale mucous membranes in the lower eyelid. They get some swelling under the jaw uh, associated with. But the primary impact that we'd be looking for is anemia. And when you look at that reference, that's the first thing they say. It's an anemia issue. That makes sense on kind of what we're what we're thinking in terms of that respect. Okay. Uh, the other from there, it's uh, a lot of your uh, youth possibly have done some quality assurance training if they are showing at state and county fairs, and so we're we're going to incorporate a little bit of basic quality assurance things. Uh, the first one is related to labels. Okay, and uh, we would view envision potentially having a a label from a particular pharmaceutical, whether that be a, an antibiotic or a vaccine or a deworming product, and simply ask them a series of questions. So they need to be familiar with the label, what's on the label, where to maybe look for some things, and some sample questions. Uh, what's the required mode or route of administration? Is this product to be given intramuscularly, uh, subcutaneously? Is it an internasal product? How should it be administered? Um, if it's to be injected, what gauge needle is recommended, if any? Um, what's the pharmaceutical designed to actually treat in terms of diseases or uh, parasites, whatnot? And for what classes of livestock may this product actually be used? Uh, how might it be stored? And that's a question we might not, it might not actually be just a question that we view, we may actually maybe set up a little workstation and maybe we've got a particular product out there that's supposed to be stored uh, outside of light. We got it out in broad daylight, that's a mistake, okay? Or maybe this pharmaceutical is to be stored at refrigerated temperatures and we've got it out at room temperature as we work. Uh, if it's to be stored at refrigerated temperatures, it should be at the very least at the working station be in a cooler uh, with some ice and stuff on it. Things like that to recognize, do they understand the label? Do they understand how we need to work with it? I think it'll be, it's gonna be important if they're able to calculate a proper dosage rate. Now some pharmaceuticals will tell them exactly how much to give, but oftentimes they'll say, we want so many mils per 100 pounds of body weight or so forth. They need to be able to calculate a proper dosage rate for a given for a given size uh, lamb or sheep, and then finally, be able to calculate that first potential market date, uh, given any published withdrawal information that would be present on a label.
So that's what we're kind of looking there in terms of what comes from labels. Give us an idea of a, a possible calculation. Some, some dosage rates are pretty easy to calculate. Others are a little bit more complicated. For example, uh, this particular one Dr. Brink uh, came across said lamb should receive 3.4 milligrams of albendazole per pound of body weight. How many milliliters or cc's of valbazin suspension, which contains 11.36%, 113.6 milligrams per mil of albendazole, should be given to a 75 pound lamb? I'm willing to bet, unless it actually kind of worked through it, they're gonna, your students are gonna see that and think, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do here, okay? It's actually a very simple calculation, but they've gotta know what to do, okay? The first thing your students need to do is one, calculate the milligrams of albendazole needed, okay? And if they go back to that initial question and problem with the information, there's three key elements that they've gotta know to get that number. One, they've got to know that the lamb needs 3.4 milligrams per pound and the lamb weighs 75 pounds. So the basic calculation is 3.4 milligrams per pound times the 75 pound lamb says they need 255 milligrams of that active ingredient. The second step they need to know is, or the question is, is to calculate how much of this actual suspension they got to incorporate. The key element there is that 113.6 milligrams per milliliter, which is same as this 11.36%. So they got 255 milligrams needed, divided by 113 milligrams per mil. They basically simply got to incorporate 2.2 milliliters of material. So I think students, I would run through a few examples in terms of how to calculate, properly calculate uh, a dosage rate. The other one is basically looking at withdrawal periods, and I know a lot of people have talked about those, but for example, a tetanus toxoid has a required withdrawal period of 21 days, okay? We might actually put together a little a uh, question or problem says, if tetanus toxoid was administered at 10 a.m. on March 1st, when could this animal be marketed? You know? We go out 21 days, that animal actually could not be marketed until at the very, very earliest 10 a.m. March 22nd. March 1st plus 21 days puts them on March 22nd. And I guess this is a personal opinion. I say for to provide a little bit of safety is okay, that's the first day, but it can't be any th time before 10 a.m. I would actually kick it back one more day and say March 23rd is the first full day where you have 100% assurity that you have followed the withdrawal period. So the withdrawal periods might be seven days, 10 days, 24, and et cetera but I think students do need to know how to do that. Okay. Uh, relative to quality assurance, we were also looking at probably ha asking students to possibly demonstrate uh, administration of some pharmaceuticals, whether that be an intramuscular or subcutaneous injection, uh, and to appropriately select the proper needle size. We'd probably give them a host of different needles, select the proper one, uh, give us the proper location, give us a proper technique. If we're doing a subcutaneous uh, technique, even in sheep, they, they actually suggest using a, a tenting method to do that. And there is a manual, uh, and actually it's a really good manual. It's associated, this is with the um, uh, American Sheep Institute, and it is, I'm gonna pull it over here. But this particular manual uh, called the Sheep Safety and Quality Assurance Program, put together by the American Sheep Industry Association. And it's like 50 some pages long, but it's actually a really good document. Relative to the quality assurance and the injections here, it's primarily we are looking at, I gave you specific pages, I think 14 and 15 of this. If I scan down just a little bit.
puts us right, whoops, back up. Okay. We are right in here. Basically, uh, this talks about administration, injection of products. It gets a number of, of uh, inform a lot of information about where things should be go, how much should be injected at any one particular site, uh, those types of things, how often to change needles, et cetera, uh, recommendations for when and why to change needles. Uh, right down here is a chart tells you exactly the length and the gauge of needle to provide, whether it be sub Q or IM. So there's like, it's a PDF document you can download. I'm basically asking you to kind of look through about two or three pages, basically from about page 14 to 14 to 15. So there's just two pages we're pulling, but that gives some good information in that regards. Uh, the last thing is basically I think students probably should at least have a general idea uh, and un basic understanding of the veterinary feed directive, uh, which is relatively new this year, having just been implemented uh, this past January. One, I think they ought to know kind of what's the purpose of the VFD. Uh, essentially, the veterinary feed directive was put in place so that we can make sure that we're using uh, antibiotics. Uh, properly that we are minimizing the risk that we might have in terms of uh, developing uh, resistance with related of, of antibiotics that are maybe used on the human side. Uh, I think they ought to understand for what purpose antibiotics may be fed and basically the directive says is it has to be for a health oriented issue. You can no longer feed antibiotics at a kind of a sub-therapeutic level to enhance growth and performance. It has to be for a health-oriented uh, issue. And then what is needed for the producers to actually feed antibiotics. Uh, essentially, they need what's called a VCPR. That's a veterinary client-patient relationship. Basically, they need to have a relationship with a veterinarian who works with them on a regular basis. And that veterinarian then is the one who actually provides legitimately a prescription, uh, identifies exactly which animals are to be treated, the number of animals, where they're located, uh, identifies a specific drug that can be fed, the level of the drug that uh, is allowed, gonna be allowed in the feed, all the feeding instructions, including withdrawal times, number of refills uh, that could be allowed, an expiration date, et cetera. All that is incorporated into that prescription. And the one thing here is extra label use. Uh, it used to be where veterinarians could basically kind of uh, use a drug and for example maybe it was approved for usage in cattle uh, given their expertise with physiology and animal health they could say I know it, it's approved for cattle however if we reduce the dosage to one third of what you would give to cattle you could go ahead and use it to sheep that would be an example of an extra label usage that is not allowed anymore they cannot there is no extra label usage uh, with these VFDs allowed anymore. And what I did with, in addition here, and I'll put these on, I went ahead and kind of got uh, three references uh, for review. One is from FDA, one is from the Amer American Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, this is one from the basically a fact sheet from the Food and Drug Administration. It's like two pages long, actually not even page and a half long. It just provides an overview of the rule and kind of what's involved with it. Uh, the American Veterinary Medical Association, they went ahead and also put out a fact sheet and there's about three or four statements on there just to provide a little bit of a background of what's allowed as well as a little bit of a history in terms of the timeline. And then the last one I found was one called Understanding the Veterinary Feed Directive. This was an extension publication that was put together out of North Dakota State, and it does a pretty good job of putting things together in layman's terms for uh, producers. So I think there's three references there that do a pretty decent job of kind of describing what it is and what's required. So that's what we're basically looking at in terms of 
the disciplinary focus on health management quality assurance related to sheep. So I will, if you guys have got any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer those, but that's what we're looking to try to incorporate. Questions, any questions or comments? Yeah, I really appreciate those three references on the uh, feed, veterinary feed derivative, because that I know nothing about. So that'll be great. I appreciate it. Yep. I, th I thought being that that's relatively new, I think it's important for uh, the students to at least be aware of it. Uh, there probably won't be a lot in the pro in there, but we'll probably ask uh, two or three kind of questions, or we'll, we'll ask a few questions just to do they have an under basic understanding of it? So, but that's what we're for. And then we we went ahead and we tried to limit. Um, we made a deci conscientious decision to limit the number of diseases to ten. Uh, originally, uh, Dr. Brink had a few more than that. Uh, we made a conscientious decision to limit the number of parasites to about five, just so that. Our hope was is that we wouldn't overwhelm the students and they could actually identify the key issues with some key diseases to, to work through. So hopefully that's a reasonable number to ask students to kind of have a basic understanding of. Do you envision any um like vaccine program schedules that they'll have to know, like what time of year would you give this or what would you give to? I don't, I don't envision doing that. Um, if, it's in, if it's incorporated as part of a label, okay, for example, they say, um, you know, this needs to be administered twice a day, twice a year or something like that. I don't envision putting vaccine schedules together because I think uh, depending upon what type of protocol you use, it could be completely different uh, and so forth. So I think that's a little outside of what we've got here for them to know. Um, I'm gonna focus it on, let's have a basic understanding of diseases and parasites, then let's be able to understand the possibilities of what we might administer to treat, but when we go that route, they're gonna have the label to work with. Anything else I can do for you? Does that seem reasonable? It's nice to have the guidelines to go for. That's, <laughs> <laughs> I know last year it was terribly overwhelming. So hopefully this will, hopefully this will help in that respect, so. All right, well, I appreciate the two of you joining us today. We got a, kind of a thin crowd, but uh, snow and weather changing and other things going on. I'm sure everybody's busy and I'll go ahead and uh, post the actual, uh, uh, this here, the recording of this uh, on the CD website so it can be reviewed along with uh, copies of all the uh, supplemental information. Appreciate it, thank you. All right, thank you very much, appreciate it. Oh. What, what university was that sheep thing out of? Uh, the uh, Sheep 101, Sheep yeah. 201. I, that is, I'm not sure exactly. It is out of the East Coast. East Coast uh, okay. I believe it's from Maryland. But okay. I'm not 100% sure on who put it together. But it's, uh, it's, out, it's from the Maryland area. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right.